Hey, this is the fifth lecture in the digestive system. This is the last one of the digestive system. I'm going to go through just a few um, loose ends talking about hernias, rectums, and microbiome. So we're going to go through some diseases as well in some cases. Talk about hernias, both internal and external, the gastrocolic reflex, and the bacteria that live inside your GI tract. So this is a um, presentation of a nine-year-old in a low resource setting. He had chronic irritation from this hernia that's sticking out of his umbilicus. He's um, no other symptoms, no abdominal pain, vomiting. So no reason to suspect that this was uh, incarcerated or obstructing his bowel. So in general, um, the umbilical hernias are actually quite common. It affects 10% uh, of children. It's the site where the umbilical cord is going into the abdomen. So it's a natural um, place where there's a weakening of the fascia. And most of these close by three years of age. So what's the greatest risk with uh, this hernia or any other hernia where it's uh, the bowel is making its way through the fascia layer? The loop of bowel gets stuck, blood supply is cut off, or both. And actually, it's both. And this um, image is showing um, an ischemic area of bowel where the bowel doesn't isn't um, as red, it's not getting, the color is poor. So this is where the loop of bowel is getting stuck. And as it swells, you can see how this um, opening tightens down and makes it worse. So it's a cyclical problem. Incarcerated means it's stuck. And it's stuck outside the fascia, the swelling, loss of blood supply. And the other um, word to remember is non-reducible. So that means it can't be reduced back into the abdomen. And the result, if it goes untreated, is that segment of bowel completely dies off. And as it dies off, um, this bowel wall can get um, dead, and uh, weakened, and then it can erode, erupt, and cause peritonitis, and the bowel contents getting into the sterile area of the peritoneum. So this is um, an example of the surgical repair. So this little boy had a repair of this um, hernia. And then in um, this country, we would put a piece of mesh. In developing countries, not so much putting mesh because it's a foreign body, increased risk of infection, but it's closing up that fascial layer and making a barrier so that it can't come out again. The fascia is part of these layers of the abdominal wall. So the intestines are shown here. This is the peritoneum, the sac, that contains um, the part of the abdominal contents. And this fascia is this thick connective tissue that's just underneath the muscle. And it's actually showing another fascia layer above the muscle, then the fat layer and the skin. So fascia is present on either side of the muscle. So, an abdominal wall hernia is any area where there's this fascial weakness. And this was an example of umbilical hernia, but you can have several types of hernias, including these incisional, where someone's had surgery before and that area of fascia is weak. Epigastric is, describes the location above the umbilicus. Femoral 
is down here um, below the inguinal ligament. And then you can have these hernias where you have a direct hernia coming out or an indirect hernia that's following the inguinal canal, most common in men. So this is the medical scenario, men versus women. You have two military recruits and they're having their physical exams. Who of these two is likely to have an inguinal hernia, the male or the female? And since I just told you, hope you remember, it's the men. Men are more likely to have an inguinal hernia. So let's go on and talk about men and their inguinal hernias. And this is a result of the testicular descent. So the inguinal canal is carrying the testicles down through this inguinal canal and down into the scrotum. Before birth, those testicles are intra-abdominal organs. And then before birth, the testicles descend and they come through this inguinal canal. So see how this inguinal canal forms this opening through the fascial layers and down into the scrotum. Now, there are some other types of hernias. Um, these are inside the abdomen or internal hernias. One hernia we talked about in um, an earlier lecture with the um, stomach was the hiatal hernia. And that's where it's going up through a large opening in the diaphragm, where the opening from the diaphragm is too large and allows part of the stomach to be pushed up into the thoracic cavity. Then the other type of hernia is an intussusception, where part of the small bowel, in this instance, it's showing the ilium pushing its way into the cecum, the beginning of the large intestines. And again, having that push into the large bowel, again, will cut off the blood supply and you can result in dead bowel. And this is a medical um, presentation of a low resource setting. It's a little four-year-old boy with a bowel into susception. And the surgical treatment is a resection of this bowel. And because the bowel is so irritated, swollen, they have to remove part of the bowel that's dead. And then these ends of bowel, um, in his case, both ends were brought to the skin and allowed to heal and an ileostomy bag is placed over the ab abdominal wall to collect the colon contents. And then several weeks, at least with this little boy, had to go on to allow healing before these bowel ends could be brought back together. In his situation, um, the, the staff was unable to get an intravenous catheter. So he ended up having a femoral catheter placed during his surgery. And um, he had several complications. Deep venous thrombosis is very common from an IV femoral line in a child. The um, femoral veins are small and they're more likely to develop a blood clot. He also developed um, pneumonia after his surgery. And then he had baseline malnutrition, which made everything worse. Next question, if that clot in the femoral vein became dislodged, where is it likely to end up? In his brain or his lungs? Okay, so from the cardiovascular system, you'll remember that the femoral vein is gonna take blood directly back to the right side of the heart, which will go out the pulmonary artery and into the lungs. So for him, the treatment plan was to try to get him to dissolve that clot or at least not allow it to extend further. So he was getting a very low molecular weight um, heparin 
fraxiparine, I believe. And um, it doesn't, actually, it doesn't really dissolve the clot, but it mainly prevents it from extending further into a larger clot and allow time for the clot that's there to dissolve. And then for the pneumonia, he received antibiotics. And then he began a series of medical supplements. So this was the main treatment plan is treat um, the blood clot, the bowel inflammation, pneumonia, and the malnutrition. So five weeks later, um, he's on this met this uh, supplement. It's really a peanut butter paste. Um, it's a different nut in these um, in Africa. However, it's uh, fortified milk and vitamins and helps um, improve nutrition. So it allows healing of that surgical site. Now, the thing with malnutrition is it prevents the um, healing process. It creates immunosuppression. And this is just a review about the immune system, how the perfect weight gives the perfect immune system. And overnutrition um, creates like an autoimmune. So the body actually starts attacking itself. Um, and also you can get up, get to these cytokine storms like in COVID-19. So perfect weight gives you the optimal immune function. So um, weeks later, he has surgery done using a spinal and a laryngeal mask airway. And then these loops of bowel are brought down from the abdomen and reconnected and then the abdomen is closed. So for this surgery, um, again, very difficult to find a um, venous line in him. So instead of putting an ephemeral vein, um, it was decided that he would have an intraosseous catheter. So the needle is placed into the bone marrow of the tibia for fluids and medications. Now this can't be um, left for more than 24 hours because you can develop a bone infection called osteomyelitis. So um, the main thing was to make sure he had good pain control, could get him eating and drinking quickly. And so he received um, nerve blocks to help him um, with pain control. This is showing what a intraosseous um, IV looks like. And with children, um, it's actually pretty easy to pop through the periosteum of the bone. And by the way, he was asleep for this with a mask anesthetic to get his IV catheter placed. Or, excuse me, intraosseous catheter placed. So this is his abdomen, uh, everything's been closed up. And then he was home uh, one week later. Okay, so next topic, we're gonna talk about the rectum, the large bowel. Now there is a physiology called the gastrocolic reflex. When you drop food in the stomach, it enters into the small bowel and then it starts releasing hormones. And that increases the peristalsis of the colon and allows for defecation. So basically, you know, 30 minutes or so after eating, usually people will get this gastrocolic reflex and it's most significant in um, children and puppies. So it's a great thing to know for house training your puppy and for potty training toddlers. Okay, so let's go on to another medical scenario. 
This is a 56 year old man uh, being treated for a bacterial pneumonia. So after four days of antibiotics, he starts developing profuse watery diarrhea. And it's so bad that he's starting to develop dehydration. This is the disease state called pseudomembranous colitis. Colitis is inflammation of the colon. And this is an overgrowth of the bacteria Clostridium difficile, or C. diff for short. And you can see from the first image, you um, actually start destroying with the antibiotics the normal microbiome. And it allows the C. diff that's there all the time anyway, it allows it to just start taking over. So it has this massive expo explosion of um, bacteria from C. diff. And since C. diff um, expels a toxin, it's very irritable to the lining of the bowel. And so the bowel to protect itself starts to form this mucous membrane. And that's what, um, it's mucus, it's not a true membrane. And so that's why it's called pseudomembranous colitis. So this mucus layer starts surrounding all of this inflammation. And then because it's got this membrane or pseudomembrane in the bowel wall, you can't absorb water. And so it's just a massive amount of um, diarrhea and dehydration. Treatment for this is pretty difficult. Um, you have to find an antibiotic that will treat Clostridium difficile. Um, and then you can look at like things like vancomycin, but sometimes these antibiotics are resist the the bacteria is resistant to these antibiotics. So this gets into the discussion of your microbiome of your gut needs to have this biodiversity to keep things like Clostridium difficile in check. So in your gut, you've got all these different types of bacteria. Some of the better types of bacteria are the Bacteroidetes, and then they help keep these others in check, like the C. diff down here, the really bad. Firmicutes is fairly prevalent. It's even more prevalent in patients with obesity. And uh, Firmicutes as a bacteria is a very efficient energy harvester. So you've, you've heard people say, you know, I've cut so many calories out and I just can't lose weight. That's because they're getting the predominance of this firmicutes. So antibiotics, be very careful with antibiotics. Um, they kill all bacteria in the gut, not just the ones you want to kill. So if you're treating for an infection somewhere else, you have to really watch out for developing um, C. diff colitis. So the treatment options, of course, you try to find a antibiotic that will kill C. diff. Um, you try to get back um, the normal microbiome by using probiotics. And then the other option, if you can't um, treat in any other way, you can actually do a fecal transplant. So you take um, feces from a family member and then in, then um, transplanted into the patient that has the pseudomembranous colitis. All right, so we talked about um, hernias, talked about the rex, rectum, the gastrocolic reflex, um, and the pseudomembranous colitis. In lecture or with in person, we'll talk about anal stenosis as well. And that's it. And the end is near that um, this is one of the getting near the next lectures that are going to be 
the urinary system, the male reproductive, and the female reproductive system. Any questions? Leave questions, any comments? Thanks.